one has to realize that on the worldwide scale, there was an improvement in the living standards, but not evenly distributed. Brasil entrevista hoje o professor é, Jan Sveiner, ele é um economista da República Tcheca, radicado há muitos anos nos Estados Unidos, onde dirige atualmente o Centro de Governança Econômica Global da Universidade de Colômbia. professor Jan Sveiner é, tem doutorado pela Universidade de Princeton em Economia e foi candidato à presidência da República Tcheca há sete anos. Professor, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank uh, you for having me. I'll start asking you about how, how do you see the balance of state intervention in, especially in emerging markets, economies overall? Is it possible to say if it's like overall we have like more positive results than negative results or does it depend on the situation and on the experience of each country? Yeah, it depends. I think it's good to start with the recognition that the state is needed, that it's impossible to have a market economy just operating totally without state uh, being there and providing the assistance that's needed. I think the real trick is how to find the right combination so that the state is enabling, it helps, it improves the functioning of the market economy, but doesn't hinder it. So it's the right amount, but also the right type of state intervention. In a way, one would want to have the smart state, or to go back to Plato, the philosopher king, sort of the state that really does good things, and at the same time doesn't uh, hamper uh, the market system, the functioning of labor markets, of capital markets, of the product market, and so on. That's, of course, very difficult, and that's what um, economics as a profession is, in a way, all about. In the case of Brazil, uh, I don't know how, how closely you, you, you follow the situation here, but we are like in a deep recession for almost two years now, and many specialists see the excessive government intervention, in, especially since the mid, mid-2000s, as one of the main reasons of, 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 of the, the current recession. Do you agree with this point of view? So, I'm not a Brazil specialist, but I do follow the situation here, and I do follow other countries. So, I have sort of a comparative advantage, if you want, perspective on what's happening. My sense is that Brazil is an economy that has an incredible positive potential. So that in a way the question is how to realize that potential and in a number of instances in the past Brazil's economy has done extremely well. So the question is what's been happening. My sense is that Brazil has kind of added government tasks one to another so that over the last seven, six, seven decades the government has become in a way bigger and bigger and got more and more tasks. Now many of the functions that the government has performed and is performing have been very good in the sense that some poverty has been reduced, uh, education level has increased dramatically, um, the uh, sort of protection of the elderly, handicapped and so on has improved. So that all is good. I think what's the problem is that in a way the growth of these services and government provision has grown faster than the economy itself. So that the economy has become more and more indebted. The government has accumulated more and more debt and is currently proceeding on a path that is not sustainable. So. Um, Obviously, the crisis that has hit over the last two years has been very severe and has made things more difficult. On the other hand, the many years before have shown that the economy can grow very well, be involved in international division of labor and so on. So I think the question is how to bring the economy back. Part of the problem is external, that the world economy has not been doing so well. Part of it is internal in terms of the structure. The good thing is that unlike many other economies, the banking sector still seems to be in a relatively good shape, uh, capitalized, uh, has liquidity, uh, the central bank is pursuing reasonable policies. Most recently, over the last uh, few months, we see the inflation rate dropping, so the interest rate may start declining as well. So I think that with a judicious choice of policies, 
and, and I should say, of course, with the political uh, scenario, the scene becoming more stable, uh, the country can do economically very well. But obviously, the questions that I mentioned, uh, including the uh, scandals, corruption scandals, the political situation, those are big questions. Um, Europe has, has faced like a quite dramatic situation as well, like for, for the past years with, with the, after the global economic crisis and it's been like somehow persistent. What's um, one of the, the steps that the Brazilian government is trying to pursue now is like a, a, adopt policies in order to, to make the fiscal situation, uh, to, to, to bring fiscal debt under control because it has increased a lot and to put a cap on, on, on spending. Some critics say, well, it, maybe this is not like the best moment to do this considering that the economy is already in a, in a deep recession. If we look, for instance, uh, at Europe's uh, example, uh, what, what's like the correct conclusion? I mean, is it really bad to, to pursue fiscal um, measures that, that like put a, a cap on spending during a crisis, will it make, may, is, is there a risk that it make things even worse or, or not? I think there is a short run versus long run consideration. In the short run, you're absolutely right that uh, when an economy goes into a downturn, economic downturn, that the government should pursue a counter cyclical policy, meaning it should spend more and compensate for the decline in the private sector activity. And in a way, it has been happening in Brazil over the last seven quarters of the decline or so. So and that's good. And in the short run, one probably needs somewhat more about it. The problem is the medium and long run because this is not really sustainable. So in the periods when the economy is doing well, the government should in a way run surpluses in order to pay back the debt, reduce the deficits and make them into surpluses. Um, there's also another question and that's important and that is I think Brazil does have an element of problem of inefficient allocation of capital. That some of the capital is invested in a way that doesn't yield very high returns. The rate of innovation could be higher than it is. Uh, total factor productivity, the efficiency of uh, allocating labor and capital into production has not been as high as in some of the other economies. So for any given level of spending, the efficiency of it needs to be increased. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that, that like this capital hasn't been like uh, invested as, as it should? What are the prob problems that you, that you see? So, so some of it, I think, has been part of um, quickly putting together packages that may be socially beneficial, but are not necessarily carefully calculated in terms of the benefit cost analysis. Uh, some of the activities of uh, development banks like BNDS uh, in the past may have been geared more towards uh, allocating uh, capital to activities that looked uh, important but were not really as efficient as they should be. So I think this needs to be re-examined and, and I think the economy can grow much faster and therefore the debt problem becomes uh, alleviated if investment is efficiently allocated. There's one other aspect that's important is at this point the savings rate and therefore the amount of domestic investment is somewhat limited for a country that's at the level of development of Brazil. So in a way, more trust in the government will also generate more savings and more investment, both domestic and from abroad. So an imperative is increase the functioning of the government institutions so that the trust by people both from inside Brazil and from investors from the outside returns. It's, it's interesting that foreign direct investment hasn't been like dramatically reduced in, in the past years. That this is like one of the interesting things. Why, why do you think that uh, it's interesting. So talking to people who are investors here, some of them, many of them have a somewhat longer term perspective and they also believe that the current political problems and the uncertainties connected with it will get resolved. So uh, interestingly enough, they see Brazil as uh, already going through a process that's going to lead to a better business environment and they are being here essentially expecting a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. Should the level of invest investment that Brazil receive, receives 
be higher, given like the size I of, think, of I the think economy? It can be. What I think, think I think it can be. You know, Brazil is a large economy. It has natural resources, so it's endowed both in human capital, you know, people, labor force, uh, natural resources. It can certainly absorb more capital. Definitely. You 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 wrote. Uh, quite a lot about like East, Eastern European economies. You, you, you're, you're from Czech, the Czech Repu Republic, which is one of the countries that managed to, to make a successful transition from, from communism to go to capitalism and adopt like reforms that hindered, uh, that, that fostered economic growth. What are the lessons, which, which, which are the lessons that, that like what happened in Eastern Europe, which are the things that, that were done there that could actually be like re replicated in, in, in countries such as Brazil? Oh, yeah. So I think Brazil has a big advantage that it's not starting all the way from the centrally planned communist system. It started already from a Marxist, uh, sorry, from a market system and uh, has therefore some of the key institutions and functioning uh, economy that just needs to be, if you want, improved, repaired, as opposed to completely changed. So what happened in Central Eastern Europe was that there was this major systemic transformation from centrally planned communist system to a market system. And I think what helped there was the determination that people really wanted to make this shift in the regime were willing to take sacrifices, temporary sacrifices, and indeed in many of these countries, real wages went down temporarily a lot before resuming an upward trend. And uh, the economists who were undertaking the changes had a good sense in the sense that they modeled their economy after the market economies and had the incentive for undertaking the changes to enter the European Union. So there was, in a way, uh, perhaps not the best initial conditions, but what would we call the terminal conditions. The goal as to where they wanted to go was clear-cut. They wanted to become part of Europe, mm -hmm. of the advanced part of Europe. So this was an helped. important driver. That was important This driver. is something we lack, maybe. Yeah, in a way, we, yeah. But on the other hand, I think Brazil has, uh, you know, understood where it wants to go. It doesn't want to copy, copy any single country, but on the other hand, wants to be, uh, you know, democratic, rich society that's efficient and rich on the basis of efficiency. So that's, I think, the discussion right now. The other advantage that uh, you have in Brazil is that uh, many of your people in key positions, be it in the policy making mm -hmm. circles, be it in the private sector, uh, non-government organizations, have studied, traveled around the world. So they are global citizens, they understand what's going on and can therefore make decisions that are informed by what's going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. But it's, had, it's been difficult to translate this into practice. And it's not only for the past five or ten years because Brazil has it's, it's been difficult for Brazil to, to raise, for instance, its level of income in relation to developed countries for three decades now. So yes. It is, I would say, you know, where your handicap, initial handicap, so to speak, is you weren't in central planning, but you were in a mode that was what's called import substitution. So the economy from the 1950s on was really operating with enough protection to trade in order to generate domestic industry. And it's always difficult to switch from that mode to an open economy that really is open to competition and really exports, imports a lot, exports a lot, right? You have companies that do it. Embraer is a good example of a company that exports, imports, competes worldwide, right? So opening up to competition and changing the institutions that have existed for a long period of time can be difficult because it's not like having an inferior system like central planning proved to be and saying there's no alternative but going the other way. You have to judge which institutions, which regulation to discard, to get rid of, and which uh, to place in, in its place. What's it, what's, what does like academic research show us, shows us in terms of like the importance of openness to trade, to investment, in order to achieve like higher economic growth? I'm asking you this because Brazil, it's, it's still a quite closed economy. Exactly. How crucial 
would it be like to change this? No, I think I think it is important. It's important to do it, perhaps uh, you know, not overnight in the sense that you do it in a drastic way, but to do it with you know with a predetermined schedule. In other words, indicating that this is the way we are going, and we're gradually reducing all the. Uh, protectionist or if you want barriers that may be there, they not, need not be tariff, uh, they could be non-tariff barriers and so on, permits and so on. So improving the business environment inside the country will actually enable the firms to improve efficiency and be competitive uh, externally as well. But there is really no, no reason why Brazil as an economy which is powerful as it is, why it couldn't be doing extremely well internationally. And in fact, China is a good example of another large economy that started way behind and is uh, moving ahead relatively successfully, in part because it is you know, moving to the world markets. But doesn't, doesn't like in the case of China, the, the fact that you, it has like completely different political system it's a difference. Many Absolutely. people mention, for instance, Chile as a very successful example in Latin America. Chile is a good case. A yes. but, but it also has done a lot like during a, a, a period of, of the Pinochet uh, era. authoritarian yes. uh, regime. Right. The start was there, but what was important in Chile was that when the democratic uh, regime came in, it kept some of the initial uh, steps that were taken and built on top of it. Right? In a way, you had, in a different way, the parallel to it during the first term of Lula's government, where it did not completely abolish what was done before, but rather continued building on that. So, in that sense, Brazil knows that it can be done. Mm -hmm. It did it in the past, it can do it in the future. Many Brazilian economists are, have been discussing more recently the, the, the role that interest groups might play in, 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 in the sense of um, hindering economic reform. Um, yes, that is a serious issue, not just in Brazil, yeah. but in other economies as well. And indeed, again, opening up uh, means that you're reducing the power and influence of specific interest groups. But it's not enough. One has to indeed, in the system, have checks and balances and try not to give any particular interest group or single company monopoly power, be it in directly in the market or influence buying or otherwise arranging for it. So yes, indeed, from the standpoint of the welfare of the society, of the people, uh, one wants to have an economy that's efficient, that's well functioning, people can you know, make good wages, profits and so on, but not extra normal, not ones that are at the expense of others. Mm -hmm. Do you, can you remember like a case of a, a, a country which was like su successful in dismantling this, this kind of like interest groups and... and yeah, so, so I think the Central Eastern European countries that you mentioned would be a good example where initially they started as totally closed economies and obviously there were interest groups from the old regime that were sort of uh, powerful and so on. First decade, there were all sorts of excesses and distortions, but gradually as they opened up to international trade and competition, uh, those became much less important and in a way these economies now are totally integrated in the European market, so there are no uh, tariffs, no barriers, everything moves very, very successfully. You can find you know, other economies in Asia as well that started, uh, uh, that were you know, quite close and are gradually opening up, Korea being the most recent example. For the longest time it could not South Korea enter uh, OECD because it had too much protection, but it has gradually reduced the level of protection, opened up, the che balls are there but are no longer have the power that they had before, and so Korea is part of the OECD group. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the world has become like a more difficult place where like to operate with like supposedly hand, an yes. increase in <laughs> of anti-globalization yes. feelings? Yes, yes. So I think I think what ha one has to realize is that yes, with globalization, uh, the world is much more complicated. Things move faster. Capital moves very quickly. Goods, services can move right with the uh, digital economy that's uh, magnified and so on and so forth. So. Uh, we live much more in a world of flows. Things flow in, out very quickly, and to construct a system that's stable for the citizens of any given country 
when it's based on flows rather than stable situation is obviously much more much more difficult on the other hand the world has become richer as a result of globalization so that's a positive aspect the negative one that you started mentioning is that the benefits have been distributed in an unequal way and in a number of countries uh, the middle classes especially in uh, the richer countries the felt and in some cases uh, indeed there wasn't just a feeling uh, didn't really have their incomes growing at all while they see that the very rich are doing quite well um, in uh, a number of economies china is a good example you had a rise of the middle class that wasn't there before. So one has to realize that on the worldwide scale, there was an improvement in the living standards, but not evenly distributed. People were not like completely convinced about like these benefits, considering like Brexit and uh, the election yeah. of Donald Trump. You're How? absolutely right. And further, I think uh, in France, Marine Le Pen getting uh, you know considerable uh, support. support. So you're right. See, the populist movements uh, get their support indeed from this perception, which they augment through their obviously uh, public relations, that things are not going well. Right. And uh, in a number of countries, that's uh, visible. And as you said, the election of Donald Trump exemplifies that in the United States. And we see it in terms of Brexit. We see it in terms of rise of the populist movements, nationalistic movements, and so on. What are the risks for emerging markets uh, under this context? So, so I think that really what we have to watch out for is that the world trading system uh, not get disrupted. Uh, because what we, for instance, see in the rhetoric of Donald Trump and some others is uh, a tilt towards protectionism, uh, indeed responding to what uh, many of the people that feel left behind are saying, look, our jobs are going away, our wages are not rising, and so on. And indeed, those phenomena are there. On the other hand, as I mentioned, the world is much richer as a result of uh, trade and generally interaction in the world economic uh, activities going uh, globally and it would be really unfortunate for the emerging markets if the advanced economies which represent some of the most important markets for the emerging market economies if the advanced economies close themselves up either literally through tariffs or non-tariff barriers and so on and so forth so i think that really the um, elites in the good sense of the word around the world should try to prevail in the sense that we should keep the world open. For a country such as Brazil, which hasn't managed to catch up in terms of, of income convergence, um, is, has it become more difficult to do so? or? I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that the world is advancing faster. So if you're moving ahead and you're walking, but the others are running, well, you're falling behind, right? So in a way, I think Brazil has to do even more of what it's doing, namely advancing, uh, for instance, to give you an example. In the world, we see that countries that do well, do well because there are lots of new firms coming in and not well-performing firms leaving the market. So there is this turnover, and that brings about a lot of innovation, improvement in productivity, and so on. Brazil does not have that much of this movement. Okay, so we talked about the allocation of capital and so on. This is precisely it. So this would be one way to stimulate it. Or Brazil has really made tremendous steps in terms of uh, providing universal, virtual universal uh, education to everybody. Well, the next step is really to go beyond that and focus on the high quality education above that. Mm -hmm. Right? And the high quality, I think, is important because what we see with the globalization is that uh, the uh, model that seems to represent the world is one that's called the winner takes all, where people as consumers and everybody want the best. Right? You want to watch the World Cup. Uh, you may go and watch the local team, that's not so good if your son or brother is playing there, but otherwise you want to see that, right? You want to listen to La Channel Pavarotti, not necessarily your local thing. So in a way, you need to be excellent, right? So in that sense, the emphasis on quality is what's important. And again, to take, you know, your... Uh, you know, one of your premier companies, Embraer, it's penetrating uh, the fleets uh, around the world because it's considered to be extremely good. I mean, it is very good. This is one of uh, one of the interesting and 
somehow um, disappointing uh, features uh, of, of the Brazilian economy is, is the fact that it hasn't managed to increase productivity, although, as you said, like education in terms of schooling years has increased right. dramatically. Do you think this is uh, the explanation for this? M maybe the fact that schooling years increase, but but not the quality, of, the quality. of education? I, th I think that a it's a significant part. We see that in many countries, when you look at the success, uh, relative success, that is the quality of education, the human capital is in the end the important part. In the United States, there was a uh, study that looked at the composition of all of capital that the country has. And they find that over 70% of the capital is human capital what people have in their minds, not the machines, you know, not the banks, etc. Those are important too, but it, it is the human capital that really matters, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, everybody knows it when one thinks of Zuckerberg and Facebooks and all that. Well, you know, there's incredible wealth that's generated from a single mind, right? It seems to be like a lot for a country to do like at the same time, right? So the challenge that Brazil faces is really enormous. Do you think that political crisis can actually help in the sense that it, it, it increases like the sense of urgency. I think so. And I think a lot of very good fundamental reforms are born in crises. So if this crisis is a catharsis that uh, will help uh, Brazil you know, cleanse itself and establish a political system, democratic system that's functioning and functioning well, it has one of the necessary conditions, a platform on which to build. Look, Brazilians are extremely smart people, so you don't have a problem in the sense that you know you couldn't build. That's why I'm saying the country has incredible potential, right? You have a smart people, you have uh, resources, you know, large area, you are connected to the rest of the world. True, you haven't exploited it enough in the sense of the firms uh, doing it. But I think um, when you compare Brazil, say, to the United States, I would say Brazil has much more of a potential to jump forward because it still has all these unexploited potentials, you know, inefficiencies that can be exploited. The United States, and I'll simplify a bit, has eliminated a lot of these inefficiencies. So it has to innovate, otherwise it cannot move forward. And that's tough, just to innovate, and only you know, gain from that. Whereas if you can both innovate and catch up and eliminate inefficiencies, you could be jumping you know, very fast. You were like a presidential candidate for your country like seven years ago. What has led you to, to like... So, you know, it was very similar to this. this. I saw that the country has incredible potential, which I felt it wasn't fully realizing yet. The Czech Republic uh, before World War II, when it was Czechoslovakia, was one of the 10, 12, you know, most advanced economies. It was one of the most industrial countries in the world. So it was there once. It was one of the top countries. You know, then after four decades under the Soviet-imposed uh, communist regime, it um, became a less developed country, less developed economy. And now it's coming back. And my sense was that one could mobilize people and arrange things even better and faster and that the candidate who was at that point the incumbent was not uh, really doing so so well. And so I felt that uh, even if I run a campaign where it would be very hard to unseat him, just to start the discussion and get uh, people thinking and talking about it will be important and we did achieve it and actually the outcome was very close because it was a parliamentary election and we had to go into a second election because in the first election, which had three rounds, we kept blocking each other. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really until the third round of the second election that he managed to get enough votes. So may you stand again? For ah, <laughs> that's a good question. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> All right, Professor. Thank you so much. It was very interesting thank you for talking having to me. you today. Okay, okay thank thanks. you.